we're going to look to God's word because it, the timing of his word is always perfect. As you read it, it will speak. And we find ourselves, I think, perfectly in Colossians chapter 4 this morning. Uh, and I'll be honest, I was praying this week, Lord, what, what do I do as a, a leader of a church in the midst of a country that's going through a, a little bit of tension, we'll say, uh, as we all kind of... Uh, navigate this together, uh, what, what, do we, what do we talk about, Lord? How do, we, how do we just find our focus as your people? And I believe the answer was waiting for us in Colossians chapter 4. So I'm going to read verses 2 through 5 to you this morning, and then we're going to share a message about what I believe is the answer. When you come to those seasons in your life and you say, how am I supposed to respond? You question mark. What am I supposed to do? Question mark. How 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 do I navigate this? Uh, I believe the Lord gives us very clear directives when we come to those seasons, and I think we're in one of those seasons now. But this whole year has kind of felt that way. So uh, let's read. It says in Colossians chapter four, verse two: Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Here is the answer of the morning for all of us who believe in the Lord and also a reminder or an invitation for those of you who have not yet become a follower of Jesus, but you are a tender of this church this morning. The answer in your life when you aren't sure what to do or when you come to a fork in the road and you're wondering how to proceed or you find yourself in a country that feels uh, a little bit torn at the seams, to continue seeking God. That's the answer this morning, and that will be the answer that you can always come back to whenever you come to, or I shouldn't say whenever, when you come to the next season of your life or the next question mark of your life. Lord, what now? What are we supposed to do as a church now? What are we supposed to do with my family now or with my heart now? It's hurting with my job now. It's in, it, it's in question or with uh, our place in, in the country you've placed us in. The word this morning says, keep praying. And it's, it gives some directive to that. It says, keep praying earnestly, vigilantly, vigilantly, and with thanksgiving. And then it says, specifically, Paul says, also pray for an open door, that the word would, would have an open door to speak the mysteries of Christ. And for, uh, for the purposes of the sermon this morning, in the context of the world that we live in, and the country, uh, the history that's unfolding before our eyes, that is the simplicity of the message that I have for you as believers, as people who belong to this church family. Ups and downs, whether the, the waters are choppy or calm, whether the, the nation is going, uh, pointing us more and more towards, towards uh, revival or repentance or what God's will is for our country, or the opposite. Seek God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and earnestly pray in all that you do. And so I want to talk about that this morning as our response as the people of God uh, for the, the world that we live in and whatever circumstance you come with because I believe this is the answer that is the most elementary lesson of your Christian walk is to remember that you become a Christian because you sought God. He, de- he, he set you with your, uh, your appointed boundaries and places of your dwelling with the hope that you would seek him and find him. And you continue in the faith by remembering the childlike lesson of of Sunday School 101. You knock on the door and it'll be opened. You seek God and you'll find him. You seek first the kingdom of God and he'll add all of these other things to you. That is the lesson that gets you into the kingdom and that is the lesson that helps you persevere, or as the word says this morning, to continue. That's what continue means. It means to persevere. It means to keep going regardless of the circumstances. So I wanna talk about how we continue and then why we continue this morning. And to do that, I want to share a quote with you that was shared with me when I first got into ministry. And I love this quote because it gives you a really good measurement of your spiritual life and the health that you have according to God's view. 
uh, uh, according to your relationship with him and not necessarily according to the, a lot of the yardsticks that we look for in our spiritual health or, or our religious well-being. Uh, here's a quote by the old English Puritan John Owen. It says of this, A minister may fill his pews, his communion roll, and the mouths of the public. Uh, in other words, you, you can be a great pastor in the way that you fill up the church, in the way that the church then goes from hearing the word to partaking in communion, the communion role. And you can do some great outreach as a, as a minister. Or take part in a church that's doing some really cool stuff in the community. Feeding the mouths of the poor or the hungry. Uh, offering water to the thirsty. Clothing the naked. Visiting the, the orphan and the widow in their time of need. All of those things are great things to bring glory to God. And yet, the quote goes on to say, But... What the minister is on his knees in secret before God Almighty, that he is and is alone. So we're tempted to think of the first half of this quote as measurements for how well we are doing as pastors, church leaders, people who want to be part of building up the church for the work of the ministry. And yet it's a great reminder that you can do a lot of great things in the church and in the name of the Lord. And yet we have that, that, that little thorn in our side in Matthew 7 that should come as a warning to all of us when Jesus gives this picture of people who do great things in ministry and, ever, and, and yet they would hear from the Lord, depart because I didn't actually know you. That's the, that's the difference between being really religious and having a relationship with Christ. And how do we know that we know God? I, I, you really can't get a good gauge of it. I, I can't tell as I look out from this pulpit to the sanctuary who the, the true heartfelt lovers of God are because worship doesn't give you that indicator. Jesus says that people can worship with their lips and yet he judges the heart and oftentimes the heart is far from God. And actual church activity is not the gauge either. Uh, in Colossians is a, is a study on separating the Christ spirit in us from the religious acts that really don't bring life. That's why it was so important when we studied Colossians 2, and it said, why do you live in the world and take, char take part in all of these regulations and rituals when Christ has saved you from that? He literally nailed the regulations to his cross. He now gives you the spirit of life that by which you can live like him. So we're set free from all of the ways that you can enter into a church and feel like church becomes a burden and not a life-giving spirit of Christ in you. So it can't be the measurement of your church attendance. So what is it? Well, John Owen, I think, rightly identifies the answer. He says, who you are alone on your knees before God is who you are, and that is all you are in God's sight. And it's a great reminder this morning for all of us, when we think about the well-being of our lives, the well-being of our soul and our relationship, our good standing with God, it is a, a reminder, is a, it's an emphasis on the end of the letter that Paul says now, continue seeking God in the relationship that you have with him, that you would earnestly pray. That is how you become a believer. So for a moment, uh, in, in a brief moment, because the majority of this passage is speaking to those of you who believe, and he's saying, keep believing. Those of you who sought God and called upon his name to be saved, he's saying, continue to call upon his name and continue to work out the salvation that he's working out in you. But now I say to those of you who come to church and are not Christ followers, there's a big distinction. Not all of you who sang the songs this morning and sit through a sermon are actually in good standing with God this morning because God searches the depths of your heart, not the actions of your life, simply. He cares what you do. You have to be a doer of the word, but he wants to know truly what you believe about who he is in your life. And for, for that, here's the, re, here's the invitation this morning. You enter into relationship with God, first and primary, through the power of prayer. You, when you hear the message of the word that will not return void, and eventually God moves in your heart by the power of his spirit, it says in Romans chapter 10 that you then confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you acknowledge him in your heart that he rose from the grave and that his life gives you life. That is the beginning of your good standing with God. It is nothing before that. 
It is not simply that, well, I went to a crusade or I went to a sermon, I really nodded my head and I really liked it, and I liked the songs, and the, the, the building was cool, and I made a lot of friends in the circle. If you have never taken the, the moment in your life to call upon the name of the Lord and to say, God, I can't save myself, but by the power of your word, preach to me, landing on the soft soil of my heart, it now bears fruit in my life to know that you can save me, and I want to know you like you know me. That is how you begin. It begins in prayer. And what God begins by his spirit, he is faithful to complete by his spirit. So you start your relationship with God in a personal moment that you confess that he is now your Lord and Savior. And that's why that word continue is so important. Because it establishes the entry point by which you are accepted into the family of God. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess that he is now your Lord. And then it says, be baptized as a symbol to the the, the world that you are now following Christ, and you're in the kingdom. So if you start with prayer, by by reason, it would say it continues in prayer. And that's the the reminder for us because we, we, we are so quickly distracted. Although we believe in Jesus, we start putting our hope and our dreams and our beliefs in other things. This week, I believe, I hope, is a great wake-up call to any of you who thought that politics would save you or that our country would somehow be the, the, the preview of the everlasting kingdom. We live in a temporary kingdom of this world, and no matter where you stand on the political spectrum, you should not have lost one ounce of joy if you believe in Christ. Because the joy that Christ puts in your heart is the joy that your sins have been forgiven, that you have been redeemed from the hopeless generation of this world, that you have your name written in the book of heaven, and that you can press on towards the prize of the upward call of heaven because God has given you a spirit of perseverance that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Happiness is very circumstantial. It's all over the news right now. Half of our nation is very sad. Half of our nation is very happy. But four years ago, it was the exact opposite, right? Happiness comes and goes. Joy is non-circumstantial belief and faith in the God who is the beginning and the end. And today, we have joy. We have joy in that God. How do we have the confidence of that joy? Well, we have a relationship with that God. We have a relationship with him through the power of of prayer. And so Paul gives three very key characteristics of the continuing, or I should say, the persevering prayer. And that is the prayer that will be preached this morning uh, because we need to persevere as God's people. This is not a time for us to look around and wonder what the world is going to do to repair itself because we know, because of God's plan to redeem the world, that He is the Savior and He is the Lord. We must persevere until His day comes where He is once and for all the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The first thing He says is in verse 3 continue earnestly. In prayer, not a word we use often anymore, but it's an important word when we think of the concept of prayer, because to be earnest is is a good characteristic for you to have and develop a discipline of. To be earnest is to be committed, to have conviction in something, to not give up. Another word for persevering. And let me assure you today, for those of you who who ha- who have a life that is committed to Jesus and you you know the rhythm of prayer, you know how important it is to be earnest in prayer. But for some of you who are hearing the invitation to prayer, you may think that this is a a, a, a spiritual message that I want you to leave and and just whistle out the door, being ready to pray like it's some easy task that you have in your life. Prayer, here's a secret: prayer is very difficult. Prayer is very challenging. Uh, I like the example that we get in this without having to to scan the whole Bible, but by just continuing to read Colossians 4, it says in Colossians 4, verse 12, Paul giving his ending credits of all of those that he's giving honor to and encouragement through. At the end of this letter, he has a list of people who helps in 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 the care of the Colossae church. And one of those people's name was Epaphras. In verse 12, we see Epaphras who was one of you, he's a bondservant of Christ, he has submitted to Christ as his Lord, he greets you always, and what does it say that Epaphras does for this church? He labors fervently for you in prayer. That's a very good uh, example of an earnest prayer life. 
Earnest prayer life means that you know what it's like to labor in prayer. Uh, The ESV, some of you might have the English Standard Version, it says to wrestle in prayer. We get a picture of that as God and Jacob are wrestling through the night for the will of God to be accepted and submitted by Jacob. There's a wrestling match that often happens with your life in, in Christ in prayer. Prayer is something that you, you, you sometimes come with one idea and the Lord by his spirit softens your heart and points you towards his perfect will, not your imperfect will. And prayer can often be a wrestling match with the word, trying to submit to what God has as his standard for the way that your life should live. Many times that requires you to pray. I use the example of this sermon as an extension of last week's sermon with Reggie when he talked all about submission. And that was a beautiful sermon. If you haven't listened to Reggie's sermon, he gave a beautiful uh, sermon about the, the, the importance and the beauty of the example of Christ submitting to the will of the Father to be a bondservant, to serve us, not to be served, to lay down his life for us as a submission to the plans of the Father in redemption. And then we get models of how we can be reflections of that as wives submit to husbands, as workers submit to masters, as children submit to parents. That's a message that we see reflecting the submission of Christ to the Father. But it's a hard message to hear, isn't it, sometimes? In fact, as Reggie was preparing it, he knew quite well that he was walking into some cultural tension because we're, we're proud Americans and we don't really like to lose any form of independence, let alone to hear the word submit. And yet, Paul pens all of that to give the the Christian household pictures of submission in their own life. And then what does he say? Pray about it. (laughs) He goes right from that to say, now, pray earnestly about it. Because your, your heart can hear a message very differently than God wants you to live it out. And it's important that when we hear the word of God, we're willing to say, God, that really is not something that I would have thought for my life. But, nevertheless... Your will be done by the power of prayer. Soften my heart and let me once again proclaim that you are wise and I am not. That you are sovereign and I am not. That you have good plans to make beauty out of the ashes and I don't. And prayer will help you in the wrestling match pin your flesh to the ground. Uh, The other thing that Paul says about prayer is that we must be vigilant in our prayer. It's another word that we don't use a lot, but as the same way that we must be willing to wrestle, not only with the word, but wrestling with our flesh in prayer, wrestling with the, the powers and principalities, as Paul, as Paul says to Ephesus, that we wrestle with them. But he also says to be vigilant. Now, that is another word that we don't use a lot, but it's an important un- word for us to understand when it comes to having a healthy prayer life. A healthy prayer life perseveres when it's hard to pray sometimes. And a healthy prayer life is also a prayer life that does not simply pray when you get the feels, when you get this emotional message and you're like, oh man, I I need to pray because I'm going to the men's conference this weekend and it's part of my session. Or I need to pray because we're in Colossians 4 right now and it's all about prayer, so now I will pray. What vigilance mean is that you are always alert and watchful. In fact, you you can hear the root word for vigilance in a word that you probably hear more often, which is vigil. When something happens, a tragedy of a life lost too early, and you'll see many people go with candles and, and do some sort of prayer vigil as a way to say, we are going to stay awake through the night in honor of this person or in honor of this thing. That, that's the concept of vigilance to say, I am going to stay awake. I'm going to stay alert. I'm going to stay on guard. I'm going to keep looking. I'm going to keep, keep my eyes open for the plans of God. Now, do you want to know an example of vigilance that you can all pretty much see happening and unfolding around our country right now? People have been very vigilant on the news, right? It's like, what's going to happen? We all, everyone's front row seat. It, it, who's going to win? Who's going to lose? How's it all going to unfold? And when, when our country is brought to its knees for a certain event, you see a form of vigilance. Uh, one, one way I noticed that is I didn't watch a lot of news, but when I did, it was usually in the morning. And it looked like 
every news anchor was, was working through the night. They all had like a little bit of bedhead and some eyes under No offense to the news anchors among us, but they, you could tell that they were working some long hours, that they were staying alert, that they didn't want to miss one thing that was happening that could potentially be breaking news that they could be a part of delivering. And that example should not be something we have to wait for the world to show us. We should be people who understand the urgency of the window of time that God has given us. In fact, Paul will get to that when he says, redeem the time in your prayer. Redeem the time with those on the outside because your window is short and there are souls on the line. And there are people who don't know the Lord, but they may because of you. And vigilance says, be watchful of what that looks like. So here is an example of vigilance as a way for us to learn not what not to do in Matthew chapter 26. The model of Jesus and his prayer life, someone who did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but emptied himself and came to us in the form of a bondservant, Philippians chapter 2. And one of the ways that he modeled life for us is that Jesus was always praying. You want to talk about being a follower of Christ, then you have to talk about understanding the will of the Father by seeking the Father, by spending time in prayer. Not when you feel like it only. In some ways, it's when life is the hardest and the most difficult and the most challenging that we need to pray the most. And we get that example in Matthew chapter 26. When it says, then Jesus, verse 36, with Peter, James, and John, Uh, came to a, a garden called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Followers of Christ, your soul, the challenges of this world, the call of God on your life is not Easy. It is a narrow way, and it is difficult, and it should bring you to your knees in prayer. You want to learn how to have a deeper and more rich prayer life? Start taking steps of faith to follow God in ways that freak out your flesh, in ways that make you feel incapable to do things unless God intervened. And we see the model of Jesus. He went a little farther. He fell on his face, and he prayed, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless... Not as I will, but as you will. And that is the power of prayer in the wrestling match of the things that, that maybe we have in, in plans for our life. And yet through the power of prayer, we are given the obedience to submit to the will of God. And here's the danger as you're being called to a deeper relationship with God, even today. No matter how long you've been following with him, he calls you to seek him earnestly and vigilantly. And yet... So often we, we don't relate to Jesus in this story, but we relate to the disciples because it says in verse 46, then he came to the disciples, or verse 40, and found them sleeping. They were not being vigilant. They had lost their alertness. They had fell, fallen asleep. And what does Jesus say? Could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but your flesh is weak. And this is why prayer is such a challenge to your life. Because as it says in Colossians, when we accept Christ, we are to put off the old and to put on the new. And as we're reminded, that process takes your entire life. It's called sanctification. Galatians gives us another picture of this dichotomy that we live in when it says that you are, there is flesh and there's spirit. The works of the flesh are apparent. It's all those sinful things that we read about in the list that we're supposed to put off. Anger, malice, wrath. He says, put it off. The flesh has these things, but the spirit, patience, love, long-suffering, self-control. The two are contrary to one another, and they war against one another. There is a part of you, the old unredeemed flesh that you still live in, that God is still cleaning up, that does not want to seek God. That is why these things have become such devices of temptation, because it is so easy to give them our attention and not give our attention to God. And there's parts of you that really likes that. 
The engineers behind these devices have figured out how to give you some dopamine kicks when you look at this thing and your flesh really likes it. But it does nothing for your spirit. It does nothing to teach you what God's will is for your life. And Jesus says, your flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. How does the divide get covered? How do you go from someone, as you wake up tomorrow morning, there's a war between flesh and spirit inside of you. How do you walk in the spirit and not in the flesh? It's not by strength. It's not by might. It is the spirit of God in you that is completely awakened. And it's, it's given newness of life every time you seek the Lord. There is, as Jesus says, be careful lest you enter into temptation. If you fall asleep on the job, if you stop seeking the Lord and all of a sudden your attention's been given to some leader of a city, state, or country as your savior, or some pleasure as your ultimate aim, or something that you could do with your time that has nothing to do with the kingdom, you've fallen asleep behind the wheel and it will not reveal to you the will of God. And eventually you will take part in the destruction that the flesh will take you down the road of. So Paul says, be vigilant, stay alert, keep watching. Here's what uh, Jesus says in Luke chapter 21. Because what are we watching for? Well, we are watching for the ways that God will reveal himself and reveal our opportunity in this time to bring him glory and ultimately on guard for the day when we don't have to wait anymore. The day when God comes once and for all and the final hour has rung. And that day is coming for each one of us. You've appointed once to die and then comes judgment. And judgment is on its way. And one of the things we're supposed to watch for is how are we praying and seeking the Lord and his will for the short window of time that we have. Here's what Jesus says in Luke chapter 21, which is a moment that he has with his disciples before the cross to say, be watchful. The end is coming. Are you going to be ready? Uh, Luke 21 verse 34. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with kerosene drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day come upon you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, for, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all of these things that will come to pass, and you will stand before the Son of Man. Jesus says, when these things start to unfold, be on the lookout and pray. Be in good standing with your relationship with God. Be someone who is seeking God. All throughout the end days, you're ready at any moment because you have a good standing relationship with God through the power of prayer in your life. So it says earnestly. In other words, wrestle. Don't give up. It's going to be hard, but keep going. And then he says vig vigilant, which is stay alert, stay watchful. What is the Lord showing you as the, the call to prayer in your life? And then he says, verse 3, be vigilant in it with Thanksgiving, and this is why I love being a follower of Christ, because the message today, the message four years ago, the message four years from now, will always be a call to be thankful and rejoicing in Christ. There is a big difference between happiness and joy, and when we talk about the God that we serve and the God that we are called to continually seek, earnestly and vigilantly, it is always supposed to be with a heart of radical thanksgiving. That is who God's people are. We are a rejoicing people. We are a people that sing God's praises and trust in his sovereignty regardless of the outside circumstances. Consider the very next verse that Paul will pen when he's just given the exhortation to be thankful in prayer, he says in verse 3, Meanwhile, praying also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains. The message of Paul's continual call to thanksgiving is typically in the context of a very trying, inconvenient, and challenging time of his own life. He penned the entire letter to the Philippians in chains, awaiting trial for his life. He's now writing to Colossae, 
remembering his chains, but not asking for deliverance from the chains. His prayer is not to say, and also, could you pray for me that my legal counsel or some sort of plan to get me out of here, or if there could be a a, a quick and speedy trial to get me a verdict of innocence so I can get back to what I want to do in my own life. He says, pray with thanksgiving. Pray for me to have an open door to speak the word. In my chains, the mystery of Christ I'm in my chains to preach the the mystery of Christ. My chains are actually a tool of my preaching. And so when we think about Thanksgiving, we have to realize that God is not off his throne. He's no less sovereign and he's no less powerful to use the circumstances of your life when they seem extra challenging, when they seem extra difficult or extra inconvenient. Uh, Wherever you stand on the political spectrum, you can pray with Thanksgiving today because of the God you serve, because there is a God of the whole world, not a God simply of one country. As I was kind of this week unfolded in my own life on Tuesday, which was the, the, the day to vote, the, the pastors and I, and, and Connor, who's overseeing the uh, college age ministry as the intern. What's up, Connor? So we all got together and uh, we decided to pray. And use that day, a day of uh, our country's decision, to seek the Lord. And we, we did that in such a way where we, we kind of divided up our city with all the different corners of our city that we, would, that we would kind of look out and pray. So Connor went to the train depot and kind of looked over Boise State and prayed for the, uh, the college kids among us and what God is doing in that community. Uh, one of the pastors went to the airport and he watched all the planes coming in. Watch all the planes leaving. Because our city right now has a lot of incoming and outgoing traffic. It's like, Lord, we want to be watchful. What are you doing? Give us eyes to see what you're doing. Uh, We had a pastor go up to Table Rock, pray from the foot of the cross, remembering why it is that we look out in our city and, and want everyone to know the glory of God because there is a God who has demonstrated his love for us by dying on the cross to cover our sins, to give us newness of life. Uh, a couple of pastors prayed in just some various parks around our town. And at the end of the list, uh, I got the, the, the last li- little location to go to, and it was the state capitol building. And so I'm just down at the state capitol building on election day, and I'm praying. I can't help but think through all of the different ideas that I have for our city and our state and our country. And I'm saying, Lord, do this for our country. Help us, Lord. Deliver us. Move us in the way that we should go. And yet, while I was praying, in one of the ways that you'll find this happen in your own life, the Lord can so quickly turn prayer into just sweet times of worship. And let that be enough, to just simply seek God and trust Him and to love Him. And I found myself reading Psalm chapter 50, which really gave me such confidence for the God that we serve. I'll read it to you now in in your homework assignment to pray this week. I encourage you to think through Psalm chapter 50, lest you think that prayer is just some religious exchange that you have to make with God. As though God's waiting to bless you you after you kind of get your ducks in a row enough to be spiritual enough to pray. That's not the exchange that's happening. And I'm reminded of that when I, when I read Psalm chapter 50, and I'll start in verse 7. It says, Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or for your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine. And the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all of the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field. They are all mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and all its fullness. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink of the blood of goats? The question that God is asking is, do you really think that I need all of this religious activity to somehow be satisfied as your God? He says, the whole world is mine, and you think that I need one specific country to to usher in my plan of redemption. He will use all the sovereign leaders that he has put in place for his glory and his perfect timing to work all things together for good. And he will use all of the church activity. Some of it is worshiping him with his lips, some of it with his heart. But it is not so that we simply put a smile on his face. 
He's not asking us to make sacrifices because he needs the animals or the fruit or the vegetables or the money that is offered to the Lord. What he's reminding us is, it's all mine. Whatever money you have, I gave you. Whatever gifts you have, I gave you. Whatever country you live in, I placed you there. Whatever leaders there is there, I allowed it. I'll put up with it. I'll use it. Whatever religious things that we are doing, are, it is not the point of our relationship with God. These are things that we can use to learn and grow and be edified. But this is what God says in rebuke of people who think they are making an exchange with God. He says, offer to me thanksgiving. Pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon my name in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. God says, just be grateful. That's what the sacrifices are meant to say. God, I'm not afraid to give back to you what you gave to me because I know you have an entire storehouse of things that you could freely give. You cannot outgive God. And so in all of the sacrifices we make, whether it's preaching or singing songs or serving in a Sunday school, serving your family, laying down your life for your family, th these are our ways of saying, God, we give you these things out of hearts of gratitude because you've given them to us and you have more where that came from. God doesn't need our money. He doesn't need my words. He doesn't need our songs. He gives us all of these things because he loves us, because he knows that it will build us up. And he says, I've told you these things so that your joy may be full. And the more we get to serve God heartily unto the Lord in all things that we do, the more that we get to take part in the fullness of joy of what happens when someone puts their faith in Jesus Christ and then follows his commandments. It is a life full of joy, a life full of abundance, a life full of hope, a life full of love and community. These are all to our benefit, and may God be glorified in all of it, but he does not need us to do it. He says, just be thankful. And so what we say this morning is, we are going to continue to seek God the same way we did yesterday, and the same day we will until he calls us home. And we are going to do that by saying, thank you in advance. You want to have faith in Jesus? You want to allow your faith to grow this morning? Start thanking God in faith in him for things that haven't quite worked out in the way that you understand or see quite yet. That's faith. That's saying, God, I thank you in advance because I know that you're good. I know that you're faithful. I know that you're merciful. I know that your word says you work all things together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purposes. So thank you for this day and all of the blessings that you're going to give me. Thanks for the, lung in, the air in my lungs. Thanks for the community that you've placed me in. Thanks for the country and all the things you're going to do to win and redeem the lost souls of this generation. Thank you, God. We love you today. That's what we say. And then we were reminded that as we do this, there is a call to action in our seeking God. We don't seek God simply to get a preview of heaven and, and really just wait around until it's finally here. We seek God because it gives us the encouragement that we need for our lives, and it also gives us an understanding of why we're still here. Why is it that when you got saved, you weren't just brought up to heaven? It's going to be a lot better, I promise. The everlasting kingdom is going to have no sorrow, no tears, no pe uh, everlasting peace, no war, no elections. It's going to be great. <laughs> why don't we just do that now? Or why don't those of us who are saved do that now and the others can get it worked out? Well, God wants to use your life. When you seek God, what you find is that God has prepared good works for you that he's revealing. God's given you open doors that will be, will be revealed in the power of prayer. And that's why Paul says in verse 3, Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, the reason I'm in chains, to speak the mystery of Christ. Uh, this is my prayer for the people of God in such a time as this, that we would not simply ask God to comfort our hearts or to give us clarity for the future, but we would say, God, we got a short window of time. Your word says to redeem it. Your word says that we are part of a lost generation, so God, give us an open door to be used by you, an open door to share your word, an open door to express your love. And so, as a, as a little preview of where we're going to be next weekend, starting Friday, I cannot help but think of the story of Esther. 
And so for those of you who have already signed up for our men's conference, we're going to be looking at this story of this little Jewish girl that somehow by the providence and sovereignty of God rises to the ranks of Queen of Persia. And as you read the story, you realize that it is all for a very specific mission that God has for her life to be used as an instrument of God to redeem his people. And there's this really important phrase that comes to Esther. She's become the queen, and her, her cousin Mordecai uh, is, it, it approaches her and says, Listen, God's people are in some major danger, and you have the ability to, to help them. And then what does he say? Who knows, Esther? whether or not you are here for such a time as this. This is the reason that you're here. Who knows? Who knows the reason? Well, Esther responds by saying, I'm going to pray and fast for three days. In other words, God knows the reason. God knows why I'm here for such a time as this. And in the same way, I'm going to be your Mordecai now and say, who knows? Each and every one of you who have been born again by the power of God, given a spiritual gift, and who knows whether or not it is for right now, in a country that's divided and confused, and half is celebrating and half is sad, who knows in your position whether you're here for such a time as this? Do you know who knows? God knows. Go seek him. Go find the answer for the open door of your life that when God opens a door, no man can close. And when the word is preached, even in spite of the difficulties, Paul says, I have changed. Let me preach the word. I say to some of you who have heartbreak, let the word be preached. You have lost jobs, let the word be preached. You have challenges in your family, in your church, in your city, in your workplace. You are confused in so many areas of your life at time and time again. Let the open door of the word be revealed in your life today. That is why we seek the Lord. Because you want to know where the open door is? You want to know such a time as this for your life? When you get to be used as an instrument of God for his glory to save his people, you got to talk to him. you got to spend some time seeking him earnestly and not giving up. And being watchful and vigilant. And so, if you haven't got signed up for the men's conference... <laughs> Please do come. This is the last invitation, and we're, I'm, I'm starting it now because I think this message is so important for the men of our church. But we're also going to finish our men's conference by sharing some things that happened and a recap at our main service next week. So we've gotten a little preview of the message of next week, and I'm going to share some open-door stories that have happened in our church from this year. I want you guys to hear them. I want you guys to celebrate them with me, and I want you to know that they're not unique to the people that share them. They are simply the sovereign providence of God opening up doors that no man can close for such a time as this. And we all have the responsibility to be vigilant and looking for the open door. Now for all of us, I want to end with one passage of scripture. As an encouragement, excitement, hope, this is a passage of scripture that I've heard on and off throughout this year. And for those that when you live in a season with the Lord where you keep hearing the same word, take it in. Underline it. Put the year next to it in your Bible because the Lord's trying to say something to his people. We heard a lot about Hebrews. Don't neglect the uh, fellowship. It's like we got to be together. I heard a lot about that. 2020, Hebrews. And I also hope that you'll hear this often because I believe this is a passage of Scripture that is so appropriate for God's people in such a time as this. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Let me read it to you, and then we're going to stand and pray. It says in the word, If my people who are called by my name, my people who are called by my name, Christian, Jesus Christ follower, lover of God, be called by his name. Identify yourself as the people of God this morning, not the people of another leader or another country, another city or state. You are the people of God. And he wants you to be called by his name. If my people who are called by name, my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal, heal their land. That is the promise of God this morning for a country that needs to be healed. For people that need to repent because we've looked to the gods of this age instead of our own God. For a, a, a land that needs to be 
brought up and edified and built up to the glory of God. And what does it take? What does it take for a heart to be healed, a family to be healed? You turn to God and you pray. And God will be faithful to meet you where you are at and be your present help in time of need. Offer me your thanksgiving, pay your vows to God, call on my name, and I will deliver you. And the people of God across this country and this world, I believe by the power of this specific word, are being called to seek his face in a brand new and fresh way. A way that will bring so much glory to his name because healing brings glory. Repentance brings glory. Community that is established in prayer brings glory to God. And that is the word that God has for us as he says, continue in prayer, earnestly, vigilantly, and with thanksgiving that an open door may be revealed to each and every one of you.